so we're hoping that um, you get a glimpse of the work I've been doing for the last um, year and a half in Miami, which has been finishing the legacy of Mr. Lapidus. And then I'll speak a little bit after the video. Carl placed a wet stick in the sand and drew his magic city. Jane Fisher watched in amazement as the city of his dreams came into being. She thought at the time, in the honeymoon of their marriage, with the dark magnetism so much a part of his being, Carl Graham Fisher, as she saw it, that he could move mountains. Within 15 years, their new city was born, and the world would soon see, as clearly as the boy who dropped out of school due to a severe astigmatism, that Carl Graham Fisher's vision was unparalleled at the time. We find in hindsight that he had 20-20 vision in predicting the convergence of land, sea, and sporting lifestyle that was unparalleled in supplying health and vitality. As his Miami Beach would become the playground of the world, it is recalled now that from the first line in the sand that represented what he would call Lincoln Road. From there sprang a paradise and the unparalleled Garden City. So. What you had was Carl deciding, though, that he was going to build the first Ocean to Bay Street, and that street was given the name Lincoln Road. The interesting thing for me is now, living in Miami, we see mangroves, and they're twiggy little trees that come up out of the ground. But when you see the photographs of the trees that were taken down to make Lincoln Road, it was a primordial forest. It had not been harvested s since time immemorial. And I can only imagine the level of labor that went into falling those trees and tearing their roots out and then filling it to make it Lincoln Road. Carl Fisher placed his house on the ocean, his real estate office a block up the street, the community church a few more blocks up the concourse, all within walking distance or a short car drive up the street. The property that we own uh, here at the Ritz-Carlton was the site of the uh, first residential area in the city. Uh, Carl Fisher had his home here, Jay Sieberling, his, his, his cohort, had uh, a home here. And um, they literally built tennis courts and a whole community right by the sea. So it started off that way, you know, back in the, back in the 20s. We had people coming here from Detroit, from Minneapolis, St. Paul, from St. Louis, from New England from Memphis, from all over the country. But Lincoln Road became the place to go to see and be seen. I'm Stan Arkin. I'm a retired general contractor and a very long time resident of Miami Beach, having moved here in February, late January, February of 1935. And as a, a youngster, it was a, a very important time to us when the weekends came and my father would be dressed in a coat and tie and dress the kids up with my mom and we would walk up to Lincoln Road and look at the stores in awe. I can remember Lincoln Road coming with my grandmother and we did not dress in bikinis and we didn't dress in shorts. We wore very fancy party luncheon dresses and I wore little white gloves and a hat. And that lasted until the last few years of the 50s. By 1959, with the opening of the major resort hotels, the Fountain Blow and the Eden Rock, both by Morris Lapidus, Lincoln Road Shopping Center fell into decline. The shop owners on Lincoln Road got together and asked Mr. Lapidus if he'd be willing to help them find a solution so that they could garner some of the business for themselves. Morris Lapidus suggested closing off the street from traffic and turning the road into a pedestrian mall. And he had something else in mind. The committee asked me what my thoughts were and I told them that I would like to make the street a garden with trees and plants and shrubs, a street with pools and fountains and waterfalls, a street with large concrete shelters so that people could pause while they walked to the mall, sit down for a rest and continue their shopping. Lincoln Road to me 
connotes almost something eternal. Things happen and change at a rapid pace all over Miami Beach over the years, over the decades. Lincoln Road rises, Lincoln Road falls, but it always managed to, manages to resurrect itself and come back. Uh, my, my grandfather uh, and my father, who was only, I think, 25 years old, acquired the Dilito in 1971. So that's uh, more than 50 years ago, 51 years ago. That's uh, this, uh, this legacy and this historic asset has been in the family. And I, even though I was only three years old when they acquired it, I, I have fond memories of, of being uh, in around the property, uh, you know, running around, playing, play, playing in the front desk. Yeah, I, I remember that uh, across from the Dilito, we had the Carl Fisher house. Uh, and, and the restaurant, I, I, I do remember going, I, I have faint memories of how it looked like. It was meant to be the spinal cord that connects the city, that provides the nerve and the energy juice and the, the, the heartbeat of the city itself. There's really nothing else like Lincoln Road in all of Miami Beach, and I don't think there ever will be. It stands as something unique and a testimony to the vision of people like Carl Fisher, and others who made it what it is today. Morris Lapidus made it what it is today. So Lincoln Road, uh, it, it, it occupies something very, very special in my mind. And I remember coming down here at times when I was younger, a little kid, and it was practically dead. It was on its last legs. And you look at it today and you see how it's made a comeback. That's really been the story of Lincoln Road. It's been kind of like a roller coaster. But Lincoln Road itself is, it's just a beautiful legacy that they have left for us, for modern developers, for city planners to work with. So, so it was magical, no? So we, we would go end, end to end Lincoln Road, the old uh, trolley, trolley carts that would take you, that was, that was a lot of fun being a kid and you know, spending time going on, on those trolleys. And, and sometimes our parents would let us go by ourselves. They would be shopping, we would get a trolley and we would do the whole circulation on Lincoln Road and like multiple times because it was fun just to be on, on those uh, trolley buses. We have this beautiful Lincoln Road here. We already have the urbanist dream that was established by generations before us. So why don't we utilize that? We now have to reimagine that. We now have to repopulate that with the kind of people who live here, who have a stake in the community and who are really going to use these things, patronize these businesses on a consistent basis, be here when the economy is good or bad. These are the type of things that we need to rebalance. When you come down to the eastern end of Lincoln Road, of the mall, you hit Washington Avenue uh, um, and you're suddenly, you, it's, it's this wall of traffic and cars and so on. And, and people want to be able to walk. It's a, the, the, the boardwalk on Miami Beach um, has, it draws a lot of people. Um, people want to come there and enjoy the beach and, and enjoy that walk but um, it, doesn't, it doesn't link. If they want to go to uh, the Lincoln Road Mall, you know, they've got to cross that two block stretch of sort of the middle of New York City. It's very busy, it's very congested. To further extend that spine and connect it all the way to the ocean. Um, similar, you know, with Carl Fisher, when I think of Carl Fisher's vision, it was interesting because he had a beautiful pier, a long pier at the end of the Lincoln Road. So there's always been sort of a, I think, uh, an unwritten desire to have the whole thing connected, but we haven't seen that in, you know, built yet. That would be a great expansion, especially if we added to that um, the really enhancing the availability, the accessibility of a historical consciousness, of a historical awareness. Art confronting people in the public space is a great thing to do. How it affects your interior well-being, but when you're around something that is aesthetically well-devised, it changes you. And it doesn't have to be a building. Sometimes it's something as beautiful as, as just nature. As owners of the Delito Ritz-Carlton, we're very aware that we are the historical anchor of Lincoln Road. The location and the hotel itself embody the history of so many founders who shaped the heart and spine of Miami Beach. Fisher, Lapidus, Polovetsky, 
and Sirkin. I speak for all three of our ownership families when I say that our singular focus is to see a unified Lincoln Road from bay to sea, a revitalization of the blocks between Washington and Collins Avenues, not only as an aesthetic connection of the Lincoln Road and Beachwalk Greenbelts, but as a functional extension of the vigorous commercial uses the rest of the mall enjoys. It's within our grasp to finally complete the legacy of our founders. We can revitalize Lincoln Road and the heart of our city, rebuild a community of permanent residents, and reinvigorate our economy. It's the common vision of a public-private partnership that will get this done. And we are optimistic that that time has come. Carl Fisher asked John Collins to place two flowering trees for every avocado he planted. He wanted to create something of beauty. Today, seeing his city filled with cars turn into the walkable city filled with gardens would complete that dream, that paradise that he had promised his wife. To do that, we need community. And what makes a community? We do. Thank you so much. I've been here in Miami Beach for the last two years working with the Ritz-Carlton, trying to complete the legacy of Mr. Lapidus to bring the extension of Lincoln Road to the ocean. Tonight we're going to be having the first of many discussions that the city will hold on the revitalization of Lincoln Road from Washington to Alton. That is, a, I think, a $62 million project that's underway. Can, at the same time, the Ritz-Carlton has been saying we need to end, make a better entry for us, and complete the vision of the elders. We hope to have Lapidus's arch at the end, which was one of the last things that he drew, uh, that he thought would be an entry feature into the ocean, I mean, from the ocean into his Lincoln Road. And we hope that um, these will be going on at the same time. So the next time you see our city, you will not see Lincoln Road the way you see it now. This is this is the, um, the, the twilight moment of um, Lincoln Road for it to have its um, rising up from the Phoenix. So the next time you're here, you'll see it very different. Um, I did want to read a little bit to you, but I also want, to ask, want you to ask questions. So I want to just, I could go block by block and tell you what contributes, what doesn't contribute. Uh, what I really thought I would basically say is that Lapidus loved Lincoln Road. At the end of his life, when I asked him to describe Lincoln Road, he took up a paint set and he painted a garden. And he said, that is Lincoln Road. That is what everybody has inside of them. We need to put a garden in the heart of people. So I think the, the most important thing for me about Lincoln Road was taking Mr. Lapidus to Lincoln Road. And he would sit and we would talk at the different restaurants. And he would say, Deborah, heaven is a place where good friends sit and talk. Um, Mr. Lapis offered us all a glimpse into his mind of a child that he designed from, that innocent vitality where people can coexist holding hands, jumping on blicks, uh, you know, on the side, and um, sharing ice cream cones. Mr. Lapidus is famous for his have one scoop, two, no, have three. Too much is never enough. He was, of course, talking about ice cream. That became an epitaph of his style. But in, I think we have 40 ice cream shops on Lincoln Road. So try an ice cream when you're on Lincoln Road and reclaim your innocence. So I don't want to say anything more, but I want to open it up to questions because I know last time I spoke too long. Um, so <laughs> does anyone have any questions specifically about the relationship of Lincoln Road? Or would you like me to give you a little bit of the... His, a little more history of Lincoln Road. I can, it's on the National Registry of Historic Places, I might mention that. We did do that in 2012, and on the backbone of it being a garden. Yes, may I have? Do you think Lincoln Road is suffering from the same issues as walls? No, not at all. The, the question is, do we feel like Lincoln Road is suffering from the same um, problems of other malls? Um, I can... 
tell you that 400 malls were made in America. Lincoln Road is the second mall. It's the longest mall in existence, and it's the one that's the most original in the context of what it looks like today. Lincoln Road has never suffered to the degree that other malls have because of one big difference, community. It is the largest living cultural artifact of our community. We love it. We use it. It's not just for our tourists, it's our living room. And that makes it incredibly different. People always are what will make a difference in a space. And we have that kind of um, community vitality that resurrects Lincoln Road every time it seems like it needs to be refreshed. But we still also hold on to the past. It's like that keep, what is that? Something old, something blue, something marvels, <laughs> something new, something old, something new. We could almost say that it's been a community wedding of sorts that dances with us on Lincoln Road. Yes. I made that six months ago, but I've been recording everything about Lincoln Road since 2009. So some of the interviews that you've seen were taken in 2009. That young girl in there was me, but that's 2009. Yes? How did the commercial establishments figure during the pandemic? Interestingly, Lincoln Road was still active. That's of course, you know, we won't say that they were thriving as they did, but Lincoln Road became a place where you could still walk your dog, where you could still go out and meet people. It became still a place for what Lapidus said is the greatest thing about life. We can encounter each other. I'm not sure. He asked about the uh, sculptural element at 311 Lincoln Road. If it's not exactly on Lincoln Road, I don't know the author of that sculptor. Yes, ma'am? You mentioned that there's a meeting coming up to She's asking, how can we follow the occurrences on Lincoln Road? The city tonight is having a Zoom meeting on the James Corner plans to redo Lincoln Road. That is the $62 million renovation that's undergoing starting tonight. They will be renovating block by block. And so tonight they're starting with the Meridian block. And the James Corner site, the James Corner plan should be on the city website. And the meeting for tonight should also be announced. May I help? Uh, yes, anybody else with a question? Um, my, my, my question would be what inspired Morris Lapidus for uh, yeah, the things he added onto Lincoln Road, what looks like the piano keys or uh, like uh, deconstructed parts of cruise ships, uh, the fountains, and, and that element. The elements on Lincoln Road do have names. They are whimsical. Where do they come from? I think I mentioned that Mr. Lapidus was from Buenos Aires, or half of his family lived in Buenos Aires. Morris was really strong about traveling. I think all the places he traveled to inspired him. Now, the supersized cross that you have in Buenos Aires, I have pictures of Mr. Lapidus there with his wife. And they were there before the design of Lincoln Road. This idea of supersizing sculptures may have just come from that cross. But what we have is Morris Lapidus doing supersized easels, supersized couplings, supersized fountains, clams and crabs. He wanted the sculptural items to be indicative of something that was happening in the space, or at least be somehow an indicative um, of what we might see in that space. So these were like little billboards on the mall. And certainly I think the black and white stripes come from our friends in the South. Okay, if, if I have, a, do I have a few more minutes, Jack? Just in summary, Lincoln Road Mall, built in 1960, is a mile-long pedestrian mall consisting of a series of blocks running west from Alton Road to its eastern terminus at Washington Avenue. Each block is bounded by north-south automobile crossings and features that are designed landscapes comprised of fountains, thin shell concrete shelters, planters, and resting on a street scored in horizontal lines and alternating black and white stripes. 
The pedestrianization converted a 100-foot wide thoroughfare into a tropical landscape with a decidedly modernist character uniquely reflecting its place and period of construction and exemplary of the work of its architect Morris Lapidus. Blocks 400 to 1100 at the east and west ends of the mall respectively have been altered and are classified as non-contributing but are included in the boundaries as part of the original mall. There are 58 con contributing resources and 25 non-contributing street objects. So out of what you're looking at, Mr. Lapidus has about two thirds of it is really original and one third of it, the little bollards that are on the road and a few other things are not original. I wanna just show you really quickly the slides. I'm not sure if I can, but um, yeah, this is the, what Florida looked like when Carl Fisher decided to come to Florida. This is having a vision. This is what Carl was doing with his time. He was giving us the Lincoln Road and he was also giving us the Dixie Highway. The Dixie Highway would terminate at the bridge of the Venetian Isle at 15th Street on Miami, which would become 17th Street. In effect, Carl Graham Fisher built the roads that led to Miami Beach and the Dixie Road of Carl Fisher's work in America. And the Lincoln Highway is his road from New York to California, of which Lincoln Road is the mini-me. So here Carl Fisher sits thinking and dreaming about how cars are gonna move around America and how he's gonna get them to Miami Beach. A city he's gonna dredge from the ocean. A city he's gonna hire elephants to fix a city that's as flat as a pancake with maybe a few palm trees. That, that's why the avocados had to be tampered with uh, two flowering trees. Morris Lapidus at that time would be in New York City dreaming he's gonna be a scenic designer and painting the bust of Lincoln behind him. It's ironic, isn't it? Isn't it ironic how life turns around that he comes to Lincoln Road and with Lincoln Road. He too loved Lincoln. Um, Harry Serkin was the developer who hired a young Igor Polovitsky who came from Russia. And Igor was born in 1911, 1911. And so at 24 or 25, he came to Miami after having a degree in architecture. And Pop Serkin, who was also Russian, decided that he would hire Polovitsky to design 10 of his buildings, of which eight of them are on Lincoln Road. And the Delito, the Wolfies that you see is his, town and country is gone. The Lincoln One Center, the, um, the Saks Fifth Avenue building they would own, they would own the Delano, the um, Shelbourne, and then Mr. Lapidus would wind up designing the Delito Hotel. So when you're on Lincoln Road, look at the Albion, which is still there, the Lincoln Center building, and look at the one Lincoln Road shop. Those are really wonderful examples of Igor Polovitsky. Probably more interesting to me is you have this confluence of three Russians coming into Miami Beach and defining a style that would become the mid-century modern stamp of architecture, coming from St. Petersburg, coming from, also coming from Odessa, and Mr. Lapidus coming from Odessa. So we have three founding fathers at one time coming together, probably drinking their vodka and saluting each other for, the, for this great effort that they're putting in to changing this style. That's the end, but the learning from the masters. <laughs>